Welcome, everyone. Good evening. 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 Welcome to all of you. My name is David Vine. I'm a professor of anthropology in the Department of Anthropology. Professor of Anthropology in the Department of Anthropology here at American University, and it's really a pleasure to see everyone. We are a gathering of anthropologists, friends of anthropologists from across the university, from the School of International Service, from the College of Arts and Sciences, from beyond, again, from beyond American University as well. Um, we're thrilled to see friends from uh, around the DC area, as well as the anthro curious, uh, for our conversation tonight Anthropology in the Age of AI, Fake News, and Social Media. I can promise you that ChatGPT did not write my opening remarks. <laughs> I tried to get into ChatGPT, but then I couldn't remember my password. Oh, wow. um, I wanted it to do the work for me, but. I should make you aware, and the technology that is, to some extent, capturing my words and later words of others is a sign that technology and a recording is in process. Uh, so just to make everyone aware of that. And all of you give yourselves a round of applause for being here for an in-person event. <laughs> I want to thank a bunch of people. I want to thank the Department of Anthropology, the School of International Service for helping to make this event possible, the College of Arts and Sciences, Jeannie Wogeman in particular, Rohan Singh. Um, where did you go? Can, can you actually wave? Because Rohan did so much work to make this possible. I think I mentioned Jeannie Wogeman, but we can't mention her name enough because she makes everything in the Department of Anthropology possible. <laughs> Um, all the great assistants in the Department of Anthropology, Rachel Watkins, our chair, the whole department, uh, again, the deans of the College of Arts and Sciences and School of Inter International Service, the janitorial staff who make this room and other rooms in the School of International Service and the College of Arts and Sciences and far beyond, so clean and lovely and make it possible for us to do our work. And the great AV staff, including Eric Gordon, who comes and saves all our lives on a regular basis. I'm gonna introduce our three fantastic panelists and discussants, but what's important to know is that this is gonna be a conversation for all of us and a discussion for all of us. We have three great people who are gonna kick off the conversation, the discussion, but we want this to be a conversation uh, starting with a question and answer period, but really, a uh, conversation and discussion that will follow. And uh, it's one that I think we are all excited about. So there are three really amazing folks, humans, anthropologists. One is Ambassador Professor Akbar Ahmed, who each, each of our panelists has a long bio. I'm just gonna give you a few highlights. The author of many books, including two all of them are relevant tonight, but the future of anthropology, its relevance to the contemporary world, in many ways, that is the question we are going to be debating and discussing tonight. What is the relevance of anthropology today? Also toward an Islamic anthropology, a quartet of books, Journey into Islam, The Thistle and the Drone, Journey into America, and Journey into Europe. Journey into America and Journey into Europe, as you will hear, were accompanied by documentaries of the same name, reaching larger audiences beyond those that read the books. Ambassador Professor Ahmed is indeed an ambassador because he was the ambassador that is Pakistani High Commissioner to the United Kingdom and Northern Ireland. The BBC has called him the world's leading authority on contemporary Islam. That. Professor Ambassador Ahmed will be in conversation with Frankie Martin, who's an amazing 
PhD student in our department. He's the former I Ibn Khaldun Chair and Research Fellow in the School of International Service. He's written for The Guardian, for Foreign Policy, for Al Jazeera, among many others. He was the senior researcher on the four projects that I mentioned before, including the Journey into America and Journey into Europe films and the accompanying books, as well as Journey into Islam and the Thistle and the Drone. Frank, he's also co-author of a new book, The Mingling of the Oceans, with Professor Ahmed, as you see at the bottom, and the co-author of an SIS working paper entitled Good Anthropology, Bad Islam. My colleague, Manissa Maharaval, Maharaval, excuse me. No, it's good. I have a long standing record of really uh, <laughs> uh, being violent to people's names by putting the wrong emphasis on the wrong syllable. Um, <laughs> Manissa is a cultural anthropologist and cultural geographer whose work focuses on eviction, race, displacement, and contemporary social movements like Occupy Wall Street and Black Lives Matter, as well as anti-gentrification work, activism, ranging from New York City to San Francisco, to the broader Bay Area. Vanessa is preparing her first book manuscript, which I am very excited about, called The Activist City, Social Movements, Structures of Feeling and the Politics of Place. Minissa is one of the co-editors of the book you see in front of you, which I'm sorry is slightly obscured by the, the video, but it is entitled Counterpoint, the San Francisco Bay Area Atlas of Displacement and Resistance, and it's really amazing and wonderful, and I encourage you to check it out. She's also the co-founder of the Anti-Eviction Mapping Projects, Narratives of Displacement and Resistance Projects. I encourage you to check that out as well, as well as the larger anti-eviction mapping project, which you can find at antievictionmappingproject.net. So we live in a world where there are now qualitative AI-powered interviewing platforms. You can get an AI-powered piece of software that will do all the qualitative interviewing for you. We live in a world where Atlas TI, qualitative data analysis software that's been around for a long time, is now, quote, powered by ChatGPT, unquote. We live in a world where QualSites is a platform for remote video observation, interviews, and focus groups. It's a software that can capture video from any camera and uses machine learning to transcribe audio, generate keywords and topics, apply sentiment and emotion analysis, underline that part, and recognize objects and scenes in videos. Well, at least that's what they claim. So PR, of course. I haven't seen the evidence to back up all these things. Are we far from a day when chat GPT and AI powered robot, robot ethnographers are gonna be conducting participant observation? Something tells me the US military might be working on those. <laughs> I'm not entirely kidding. Are we far from a day where swarms of drone archeologists are digging and excavating sites? Are we far from a day where AI-powered biophysical and biocultural anthropologists are examining and analyzing bone specimens? Are we far from a day where ChatGPT-powered algorithms, AI-powered al algorithms, are analyzing in a nanosecond bodies of language and speech that a human being couldn't even begin to tackle in a lifetime? already there, linguistic anthropology. I think we should reject these technologies at our peril. Let me just say that at the outset. Um, we need to think critically about what they mean for our discipline and more importantly, I think, for our world. Far beyond a discussion of methods though, I think the core of our conversation tonight 
will be about how is anthropology important in our world today? Is anthropology important in our complicated world today that has issues far beyond chat GPT and AI? Why is anthropology important if it is at all important? Why is it important? Do we need anthropology today? How can anthropology be useful? Specifically, how can it be useful to improving the world and making the lives of other human beings and other species better in this world that's so full of violence? Especially for a discipline that has such a long history of being a participant in and enabler of violence, specifically colonial and imperial violence that contributed to making it possible for American University to sit on this land that we're all sitting and standing on, land that was and still is occupied by indigenous peoples, including the Pamunkey, the Nacochtec, Anacostans, and others. What is anthropology good for? So I am very excited for us to take on those questions, and I will then invite Ambassador Professor Ahmed and Frank Martin to come up to our seats to kick off the conversation. Hey, hello. Yes, good. Are you okay with the lights? This one's a bit bright, too, just because. Okay, let's just do that. And I'm assuming photos are okay? Yes, if you would do it up, please. Thank you. Behind you, maybe if the screen is kind of behind. Is I don't want to because we're recording. I don't want to shut off the camera ah, or accidentally. Um, so maybe take us away, and I'll try to work on the lights as you're as you're talking. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Vine and uh, Professor Maharaval, uh, for being here and this hosting this event, um, and uh, Professor Ahmed. It's wonderful to be with you here and having uh, this discussion in this uh, forum. So I just wanted to start by going back to the period when we met for the first time, um, going back two decades, it's amazing. Um, and uh, I took your class as an undergrad at AU here. I took your class called The World of Islam, which I think you're teaching this term actually. And um, this was at a time when Islam was being discussed constantly. It was in the media constantly. It was in politics constantly. And there was a kind of obsession or uh, paranoia, a hysteria about Islam. What is Islam in this, these couple of years after 9-11? Who are Muslims? What happened? President Bush famously asked, why do they hate us? So this question was being debated all the time. And this uh, you know, very distorted, harmful, and hurtful, and you know, incorrect assertion that somehow Islam and terrorism were connected somehow. And uh, so many people were in the media and elsewhere saying, if you want to understand the Muslim world, read the Quran. Everything is there. If you want to understand terrorism, or Afghanistan, or Iraq, these wars that had started, or anywhere in the Muslim world, Egypt, or Indonesia, you just read verse so, such and such, verse such and such, that explains everything. So in your class, Professor Ahmed, I learned, okay, that is not the case. Um, your approach was something you called living Islam. So living Islam is the name of a documentary series that you did with the BBC and uh, a book. And it was based in how people were living 
What was their culture like, their customs? Um, they were living in Muslim society, so religion is important. But how did they interpret religion? How did they see gender roles? And what were their perspectives? What were the rites of passage, the role of politics, economics, history, like all of those things together? Um, and I learned that this was something called anthropology. And it was based in something called anthropology, which was field work, participant observations, interviews. So we were hearing perspectives from people in Muslim areas talking about their experiences. And this was, you know, I, I thought very, very needed, in especially in this environment. And it's not that, uh, you know, this still here, this is, this, these are um, expressions of, Orientalism that I mentioned, Islamophobia, they're still they're still very much around. But I also learned that uh, Professor Ahmed is a very prominent anthropologist, schooled in the British tradition of social anthropology, and really uh, part of the structure of anthropology in the UK, and um, also integrating Muslim social scientists into your. Uh, understanding of anthropology like Ibn Khaldun and Al Biruni, um, which wasn't so common at that uh, point in the you know with the European British kind of canon of this is anthropology. Um, also, you're involved in public scholarship, um, doing books, films, uh, in the media, uh, trying to explain uh, you know uh, across cultural uh, barriers in the middle of uh, crises like the Rushdie affair, the Salman Rushdie affair, trying to explain what was going on. And then also advising officials at a high level about Islam, about Pakistan, about customs like Princess Diana, advising Diana on those things. So when you came to the US just before 9-11, you, know, you were kind of placed to, uh, you had this background with which to build on and you know, approach these uh, new projects that you decided to start. And I've been privileged enough to work with you on, on these projects, which have been fascinating. And they're called journeys, but they really have been journeys because they've been many years and in depth and it's taken us uh, all around the world. And so I just wanted to briefly, uh, Professor Vine mentioned a couple of these, these, these projects, but to briefly go into what they were. So they were, this was a quartet of studies published by the Brookings Institution, um, exploring the relationship between Islam and the West from different perspectives. So the first project was called Journey into Islam, and we traveled through the Muslim world. It was fascinating, and um, the project went to uh, the, the Middle East, South Asia, Far East Asia. And what I remember most from that uh, project, which was supposed to, we were going out to meet people because so many people were talking about the Muslim world. And what I remember so clearly was in place after place, people said there was a, there was a lot of frustration and they would see, they would say, we see these images of us. We see the, your media. And I don't know what that is. This is some kind of villainous monstrous kind of image that that is not my cousin or my brother or my uh, friend, that's something else. And what is causing this? Why are we being distorted like this? Is there a war on Islam? What's going on with this? And uh, and there were a lot of human interactions. They were fascinating to beat us and everything, but um, which was very important. That was very important. But this question remains. So we actually did a sequel project, the next project was informed by that, where we went through the United States and looked at the relationship between the United States and Islam and the um, Muslim community in the US. And that was multiple years, big project, uh, field work all over. Uh, we visited over 100 mosques for that and in many different cities all across the United States. And then about a year or two after that book came out, and there was also a film, the drone war started getting worse and worse um, as the war on terror expanded, war on terror expanded throughout the globe with this just devastating effects with on people, on societies in the regions that were affected. And um, 
And so we did a project called The Thistle and the Drone, and it was about those societies, about the perspectives of people in those societies, about what was happening and how they explained it. And uh, we saw that, th that there was a pattern that a lot of the places affected were areas where identity was seen in terms of tribal affiliations. And so, and Professor Ahmed, you talked about what that meant. And, and then you also had a very interesting and valuable perspective as a former government official in Pakistan, which was so, um, and continues to be affected by the war on terror. That was the thistle and the drone. Then our, the last project was Journey into Europe, and that was Europe and Islam. So how, does, how do Europeans see Islam? What's the situation in history going back centuries? And how is the community living there? So again, multiple years, many different countries from one end of the continent to the other, interviews, a documentary film. Um, so this is these projects, you'll see they're based in anthropology, but it's different than the traditional anthropology where you have one year or two years in one specific location. These are ranging across uh, areas. And um, anthropologists wrote, they commented, they responded to these projects like um, Laura Nader, who's a prominent anthropologist. Um, and uh, she's well known for many things, but one of them is for talking about the importance of studying up, studying people in power. And so she uh, wrote this about uh, uh, your work, Professor Ahmed, uh, these studies after 9-11, that you're an anthropologist studying up, down, and sideways in ways not the centerpiece of works by authors prior to Ahmed. And she goes on to talk about why this was interesting and, and different. Um, you incorporate history, ethnography, uh, comparison, and multi-sided field work. And so, um, so yeah, so if you could go back now to that post 9-11 environment where you were a Muslim scholar here in the US, an anthropologist and deciding how to respond and how did you decide to use these, the, the tools of anthropology to respond? Uh, thank you, Frankie. In fact, it's a response to uh, Professor David's question, how is our discipline relevant to this world. And before I answer that, uh, Frankie, let me thank you for our friendship over the years, your heroic work in the field, which is now uh, clearly uh, in evidence and acknowledged. I want to thank uh, David Vine, Professor Vine, who's always inspired me for his moral courage and moral integrity and his great academic excellence, a, a great combination, but he shows that really has my admiration. And of course, Professor, thank you so much for coming. I'm an admirer of your work and looking forward to hearing about it. And uh, like David, I must acknowledge Rohan. Where is Rohan? Rohan, can you stand up and show yourself once again? Thank you, Rohan. Thank you. So the question that was posed was clearly answered for us after 9-11. For me, these were almost classical conditions for field work. What is anthropological field work? Let me go back a little bit. It is field, so you can't sit with all due apologies to AI, David. AI doesn't go into the field, it sits in a lab. We have to go to the field, we have to sit in a village, we have to meet individuals. AI can't tell you how a Muslim feels when he visits the Kaaba. Yeah, I can't tell you how a girl feels when she's denied education in Afghanistan. Those are emotions that can only be captured through interviews, through personal knowledge. So this is the post 9-11 world. And I am a Muslim, just arrived in the United States. And I'm seeing the definition of my religion, my culture, the areas I've worked in, the people I've served. And I'm seeing this depiction being simplified and reduced to violence, hatred, misogyny, racism, xenophobia. And I didn't recognize that world. I really didn't. So I decided, foolishly, uh, but also ambitiously, that if somehow I could go to the Muslim world and take my American students with me, so they become eyewitness accounts, they could give us eyewitness accounts, and they could become 
actual witnesses of that world, like a snapshot, like a photograph. And we come back and present that as evidence, like the classic anthropologist. That would be the definitive answer to the world today, because I was really worried. I said, this misinformation is going to sooner or later impact America. They're going to make decisions based on misinformation. I'm not talking about the high ideals of any discipline. We're speaking on a campus and we know that the ideal of scholarship for all of us in this room, professors, students, is to reach the truth. And you can only reach the truth on the basis of evidence, fact, research. You can't make up the truth. We are living in a world where there's fake news and misinformation all around us. So to clear that fog and that dense myopia we've got in all around us, we need to just clear, cut through it with a knife and get to the truth. And that you can only do by going to the field. And again, I go back to my definition of anthropology. So you have fieldwork, you have participant observation. So we needed to go to the field, but also spend time in the field. So for example, when we are doing Journey into America, I remember we went to Chicago and we had a very hospitable, very decent friend of ours and my team. We spent a couple of days, Frank, you remember Mr. Chaudhary? We spent a couple of days with our friend, Pakistani friend, very hospitable. But it was during the month of fasting. So for the first time, my young American students were experiencing how Muslims wake up for the fast in the morning to start the fast, how they break the fast in the evening, the interaction between family, between husband and wife, between daughters and fathers, and for guests. It's a unique experience. Again, I, I can't do that sort of thing. So the participant observation was important. Then diaries, notes, film. So all the traditional support that you get in doing regular field work, except we were privileged because we had access to modern technology and AI hadn't quite made its appearance, but we were very well equipped and very well supported. And I was very privileged to have my team of young American students. And I know there's some of my students here today. And it really is a very inspiring, their enthusiasm, their brilliance. And Frankie Martin was the senior researcher. And I was fortunate, he was in my honors class, outstanding student, and he just remained with me. He did two or three classes with me and then went on to conduct these projects with me. And from there, he grew into uh, a, a, a man of great stature, a scholar of great stature and internationally recognized. Um, you look at him and say he's a young scholar and you underestimate, but he's very widely known in the most academic circles. He's published in, uh, in the top uh, journals, uh, in Guardian, CNN, He's just got a major piece coming out in anthropology today, which is the Royal Anthropological Institute, as you know. So here was the experiment. What does anthropology mean and what, does, what can it do for us? So my answer was, if we go to the field, we get this field work done, bring back these projects, write it up as a book and as a film, maybe that will help solve some of the tensions. Huge task. And we wanted the continents, all the continents. Just think of the scale. This is really a, a mad scale. We're thinking of going to all the continents, doing all the, and all in our lifetime. And this took us in the end almost two decades. And that's why you see me as a broken man at this stage. <laughs> two, two decades. But we did it. The big thing is we did it. We came back. We got these books out, the films out, and these books will be winning awards the National Award and so on, many, many awards, these books won and the films. So they were known not just on this campus and they provided the answers. So if you said Muslims are, they worship the moon god, as people were saying, they were telling me, Professor, you worship the moon god. And I said, who's the moon god? But this is how people were propagating uh, nonsense about Islam. And that began to correct. And I'm glad you're nodding your head in this way and <laughs> not in this way. <laughs> So this is what we were able to do in this, in this period. Now, Frankie had introduced me to, as uh, someone who was uh, trained in Britain, and he's, he's right because I had uh, classical anthropological training, so I'm a professional anthropologist by training. But I'm also an American-trained anthropologist, and I've had the unique privilege 
of working with some of the greatest American anthropologists. You've heard the name Clifford Gates, widely considered one of the greatest uh, American anthropologists. Lawrence Rosen, Larry Rosen. So I've had the privilege of not only working with them, but being a colleague, a friend over the years, for decades. And I mention this because it allowed me to constantly interact with these giants in terms of ideas. In Britain, I worked with Professor Ernest Gellner, another, another great uh, anthropologist. And we, as we did our projects, we were constantly interacting with these, these giants. So they were feeding us and, in a sense, enriching what we were doing in the field. Also aware that we were doing something which was highly controversial, highly dangerous, not the usual anthropology. You go there for nine months, come back, and you do a great job. But that's it. We wanted something which we hoped would provide some of the answers to the world today. And it wasn't just pure anthropology. We wanted an element of religion, theology, journalism. All these issues came up as we worked. For example, religion. I was very aware that one of the answers was how is Islam relating to other religions? People are saying Islam cannot stand other religions. Islam hates everyone. You remember President Bush said, why do you hate us? A lot of Americans were saying this, why do you hate us? So we were interacting, we were very closely associated with the Washington Hebrew congregation. Uh, the senior rabbi became a great friend, uh, Rabbi Bruce Lustig, the National Cathedral, Bishop John Chain, great friends. Uh, we had good relations with the Gandhi Center. So again, we were reaching out, interacting with people, and all, all the led by Frankie, the team would follow up, talk there, interact with people, answer questions, and uh, fill in questionnaires. So what we were doing is we were combining anthropology, pure anthropology, with religion, with humanism, because ultimately we must begin to see each other as human. And you go back to Hillel the Elder in, Ju in the Judaic tradition, who was asked, how do you define Judaism? And he said, and in one, it was standing on one leg, and he said, Judaism really is how that you treat others as you want them to treat you, while standing on one leg. Now, the same thing was done by, answered by Confucius. I'm not sure he was asked to stand on one leg, David. <laughs> he was standing on both legs. So you have this tradition throughout the world. And if you can connect these traditions, you suddenly begin to understand after the layers of all these sophisticated theologies and philosophies and ideologies and books we read, that beneath it all, there's the matter of simple humanism reaching out and touching the other, whoever it is, whatever color they belong to, whatever caste they belong to. That is the one big lesson we learned as we traveled. And that allowed us to spread that message. It allowed us to participate in conferences, interfaith dialogues, and really to convey, I think, with it a sense of hope, because we also saw that as we traveled, the crisis in the world was not getting better. The crisis was getting worse. I know there are two theories on this. Some people feel like Professor Pinker of Canada that the world is getting happier, more peaceful, et cetera. But I look around at the world and I see so much misery and so much violence. I really worry because I'm a father, I'm a grandfather, and I don't want my kids and grandkids to be living in this world where you just don't know when you're going to be bumped off or blown up or killed or taken hostage. It worries me because I grew up in a very turbulent part of the world, and that's South Asia, but I also saw the beauty and the friendship and the culture of that part of the world. And that part of that, that part of society is unfortunately being overwhelmed by the more aggressive and the violent. So the projects that anthropology allowed us to do, and I say us because these projects are as much Frankie's and mine and the rest of the team, it really helped us connect to the truth, find reality and the truth, and ultimately opened our eyes to humanity. And I think that is ultimately what any scholarship should really be about. So that is the answer to the question, Frankie, about 9-11 and the post. And you're right, it was a unique time. 9-11, post-9-11, America was a very, very unique period in this history. Americans were uncertain, they were frightened. A lot of you are too young to remember. You probably weren't even born then, 
But the Americans were genuinely frightened and in a state of shock. And we took that into account. We actually went into areas where people couldn't imagine. A lot of people said, how could you even think of going to these areas? Everywhere. I lectured at the FBI Academy. We went to a prison. You remember we met that prisoner in one of these jails. Actually, they gave us permission. We met governors and presidents and the whole range of people. And Rowan, I hope you're not walking out at my lecture. <laughs> so I'll end here, Frankie, and we'll move on to your next question. Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you, Professor Ahmed. Um, I just want to yeah, talk a little bit about further about this public, public scholarship, um, which is a focus of this department and many scholars, many anthropologists seek to make that impact through the media. And uh, you've been in the media a lot. And as I know from working with you for many years, um, and uh, Anthropology Today, the journal, described you as having a media profile as high as any living cultural anthropologist. And it's true. I mean, you're, you're global media in different country, news in different country. You've been on Oprah several times. Um, everything from that to explaining 9-11 to children, uh, Nickelodeon. So these are just very different audiences. Um, but in terms of this media engagement, how have you approached the media in your career? How do you understand how it works? And what is your advice for anthropologists and scholars who want to make that positive um, impact on society through the media? Thank you, Frankie. I feel very passionately about this question, and I hope Professor Vine will not mind if I'm very frank. You won't mind that, would you, David? I think a major failure of anthropology, a dark patch in the history of anthropology, is its failure to interact with the world after 9-11. And it's guilty of failing. So think about it. 9-11 happens. And everyone jumps into the world, fray the theater of action, and has an explanation. So Tom Friedman tells us how the world is shaping up through his columns. He's a journalist. Neil Ferguson is talking about history. Jeffrey Sachs is an economist. We are the anthropologists. And don't tell me they aren't big names or big famous names. It's Larry Rosen is the head of Princeton, one of the geniuses. He's got, he's got that. MacArthur Foundation Award, which is a genius award. Uh, Clifford Gates was still alive. So where are the anthropologists? Why are they so shy? And they were then, I think, involved in some very shady kind of uh, involvement in advising the military and suggesting that Muslims don't like pigs, so they put pig on them just to humiliate them and anger them and to tear the Quran, some silly things like that, which made it worse for them. It didn't help them. It didn't create bridges for them. It didn't create friends for them. So there was a failure. And I, I really feel very bad for anthropology. And I hope, and I really pray that anthropologists are mature enough and self-reflective enough to look at themselves and say, what could we have done at that phase? How could we apply our knowledge, our specialized knowledge, and our great store of wisdom over the years, all the books and all the studies in Africa and Asia, how could all that have helped to make this a better world? And they didn't do that. So I feel that there was a failure, and I feel, and I hope that the next generation will somehow make up for that and be aware of this failure. Thank you. Uh, so turning uh, to one of the other subjects of the of this uh, talk, which Professor Vine mentioned, um, this uh, current media age, and specifically artificial intelligence, and being an anthropologist, um, what impact do you think that uh, AI will have on humanity? And do you do you share some of these dire predictions? that a lot of experts in the field of AI, whether they're in development or academia or journalism are having about this uh, threat. They talk about AI as you know, 
having many potential benefits, but also posing an existential threat to humanity akin to nuclear war or climate change. So do you, do you share those predictions? And then what can anthropology, how can anthropology make an impact in this uh, environment, anthropology based in fieldwork and AI based in uh, synthesizing unfathomably large amounts of data and then producing something. You can ask AI anything. And as experts have shown, the answers often have bias because they're reflecting social biases that already exist. And um, there's every danger or possibility of us just going along with whatever AI says on any range of issues. Well, uh, Frankie, this is a question which I think no one in this room has an answer to because it's developing, number one. And number two is developing so rapidly that in the next 10 years, we won't know where AI will be. Now, if you take the instincts, like I can only say the instincts of Stephen Hawking or Elon Musk, they all predict a dire future as far as AI is concerned. They feel that it would end up as a threat to humanity. It may, it may not. As far as anthropology is concerned, we have to remember that AI is incredibly helpful. You know, as it was pointed out, we rely on comparative literature. So AI can help us within a few seconds. It can pull out all the studies of a particular village or a particular people. But as I said, those fine-tuned things which only come when you're actually sitting with people, you lived with people, you participated and observed them over weeks and months. AI cannot tell you that. I can't tell you the feelings of the man, as I said, standing in Mecca in front of the black stone in the Kaaba, or a woman who's being denied education in Afghanistan, and how she's coping with that. How, how is she going to cope with it? Or when Malala Yousafzai shot in the head for just wanting education. Those are moments that are so human, at least I feel that unless um, AI becomes sentient enough to even explain that, it cannot tell us that at this present moment. Now, I will make a, an observation, make a comment that AI for a lot of people in this generation uh, is so sensationalized that we think of AI as in the future running amok as uh, Terminator 1 or Terminator 2. We're seeing Arnie Schwarzenegger in these roles and we are impressed and we are horrified and we say, wow, this is what the future holds. And there's violence and there's blood and these these. SUVs going over little cars and crushing people and so on. But for my generation, we already had the scariest AI of all. And he wasn't noisy. It wasn't sensational. It looked nothing like Ani. It was Hal. Who remembers Hal? Who was Hal? You got your hand up. Tell us who Hal was. Yes, the computer from 2001, A Space Odyssey. Who well done, well done, full marks to you. <laughs> now for the rest of you, can you just describe Hal? Yes, so Hal was a computer that was on the spaceship with the um, travelers in 2001, A Space Odyssey. And over time, Hal became more and more sentient to the point where Hal took over everything. Mm -hmm. Well, Hal scared the hell out of me because <laughs> He was so cool. Hal was completely in control. Hal's mission was to get their spaceship to a certain point. And he was finding these astronauts who were plotting to switch him off. So they thought they were being very clever, being human. They thought they were very clever. So they locked themselves in an airtight bubble and they planned to switch off Hal. But Hal was lip-reading them. He was finding out what they were saying by reading their lips. And he then engineered to send one of the space, uh, the, one of the astronauts out into space and then cut his oxygen and kill him. Cold-blooded murder. So Hal is already, this was the 60s. Kubrick is brilliant. He, this, he's, he's, he made that film. And it's still, if you see the film, it's almost perfect. So Hal has been part of our lives in this current phase of human history. Now, whether we end up as victims of hell or modern hells or the descendants of hell, as I said, only the future can, future can tell. It is scary. 
What is more scary is man, because I am not completely confident that human beings will not use AI against their enemies. I can see human beings, human societies, who behave in terms of brutality towards their minorities or their enemies will continue to do so with these latest AI techniques. So you know, they'll catch them, they'll torture them, they'll do terrible things to them. And we have to make sure that that doesn't happen because their AI will continue to, if it's going to be torturing someone, it'll have no human, well, not that these uh, prison guards have any human sympathy in any case, but this is a machine. So it's not going to feel for individuals at all. And that is something we must, we must prevent from happening simply because if we still have some idea of humanity, of compassion, of love, of kindness, these are words which you'll find are not often used after 9-11. You'll notice this also. Words like uh, security, decapitate, um, all kinds of words that are suggesting a dehumanization are used. Very, very rarely will you hear compassion, love, kindness, respect. And yet these are the very words at the heart of all the great religions, Abrahamic and non-Abrahamic. Each one of these, I can give many examples of this. So I would end with that, Frankie. I would end the AI. Uh, can be of great help to anthropologists, but anthropology must remain anthropology, which is, it must in the end, and again, this is maybe my British training, depend on the notebook, the pencil, <laughs> and the shorts and out into the field and spend nine months in some remote village or remote uh, uh, suburban of some city, suburban area and come back with note, lots of notes and lots of pictures and interviews and write up that experience. That is a uniquely anthropological, I would say, gift to the sum of knowledge. Uh, every, every discipline has something characteristic and that is the characteristic of anthropology unless we change it to the point where it becomes irrelevant. Because if you change it so much, then frankly speaking, a good journalist, a good filmmaker can often do the work that anthropologists take a long time in doing. And that was one of the points that came up, and I'll end with this, on the 150th year anniversary of the Royal Anthropological Institute in London, the oldest and the most prestigious institute of the discipline is the Royal Anthropological Institute. All the great names are associated with it. And they had this uh, ceremony, 150th year anniversary. And I was very privileged to be invited to speak there, along with Professor Gellner. And this was one of the points, because some of the people present, the guests, were top-level journalists, British journalists, from The Guardian, from The Times. And someone asked this question. They said, you take two years to write a book on... Uh, a particular community or tribe. This guy can go and spend a week and come back, you know, very intense work, meet everyone, talk to everyone, and produce an in-depth, extended essay, which will tell us exactly what we want to know. So where is your contribution? What is so specific about you? And I remember Gellner answering this question, David, about what is anthropology. He answered this way. You know, he went through the list, uh, fieldwork, uh, participant observation, and looking at a society in all its angles. See, this is what anthropology does, which other subjects don't do. So anthropology will give you a little bit of a, uh, the, about the economy, politics, religion, and connect them. Now, good journalists can do that, but the anthropologists will give you this integrated vision of an entire society, 360 degrees, which is uniquely anthropological. So I think anthropology has a lot to give to the world but it must not lose heart and must not show, um, what is the English word, David, pusillanimity, when it has <laughs> collapses, and like it did in the last two decades. So with that, uh, Frankie. Uh, yes, no, th thank you. Um, and I just, yeah, I wanted to ask one question about uh, going back to your book about 30 years ago. Um, of postmodernism and Islam. And this, as you know, is one of my favorites of yours. But in that book, you talk a lot about the media and you engage with some of the postmodernist thinkers, the postmodernist philosophers, like um, Baudrillard, who has a thesis that the media has disengaged us from reality so much that we actually don't know what's real anymore. So this is talking about television and this is 
30 years ago. And you also commented a lot on how seductive the media is. Yeah. It's seductive, like you, it's a, there's an attractiveness to it. And you th we think that it's kind of like reflecting reality, but it's not. So, and I mean, and you described a lot in that book, the, the impact of the Western media on the Muslim world um, and the, just this devastating, potentially devastating impact. But then at the same time, pointing out that this is the world we live in, that we have to deal with the media and have to try and understand the media. So when, when you compare then to now, like then you had editors and producers that were publishing the, the content. Now you have decline of television, decline of newspapers, and there's just so many people uploading content. And then the AI decides what people watch and it, it can filter in. And so if someone's more inclined towards Islamophobia, it will give them more of that and, uh, or anti-Semitism. And it, you know, the, it's not inventing these narratives about the world. They're there anyway, but it, it, it's, uh, it can potentially share, share them with more people. But um, I'm just interesting because like you were writing 30 years ago about this disconnect of reality. And that was an academic discussion. And now everyone is talking about this disconnect of fake news and disinformation and uh, post-truth. So as an anthropologist, when you're looking at this situation now, I mean, do you see this as a, a continuity or is there something very different about what's happening now? Frank, in some senses, it is a continuity. In some senses, it is something new. I think technically, technologically, it's something very new. AI is new. But in terms of ideas, in terms of the trajectory of ideas, we see a continuation. You know, the grand narrative, for example. Now that's collapsing. You see, the grand narrative of the West is the dominant force in the world, promoting democracy, promoting uh, capitalism. That's being challenged now. So there's a challenge. The other forces emerging. India is emerging. China is emerging. What shape will that take? Russia is in, the, in, a, in a very difficult situation. If it continues, it's uh, almost demonic march towards on uh, onto U the Ukraine, and uh, people suspect that it may be now uh, pushing into the Middle East much more vigorously to counter America. So there's a lot of change also. So both happening at the same time. For Muslims, the problem was always the same, uh, which is how do they react to ideas about Islam? And as you notice, when you were traveling in the Muslim world, people would complain about how they were being projected in the West. They thought they were being deliberately, the image was being distorted. The dilemma was that Muslims would very often say, to me, for example, throughout, that don't stick your neck above the parapet. Because if you're too prominent, people will gun for you and you'll be shot down and cut down, which happens, which does happen. And I've been, as you know, very much attacked from time to time. That's why I got, I've got a very tough uh, assistant with a lot of bodybuilding behind him, Rowan there. <laughs> Rowan, I hope you're continuing your push-ups. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Five or every hour. <laughs> so that dilemma remains. What do you do if you're a member of the minority? Now, I'm just saying Muslim, it could be Hindu, Sikh, any member of the minority, color, gender, all these are issues. How do you maintain your integrity in this very changing world where you've lost, you've lost the command to even define yourself? Ultimately, the greatest, I think, privilege we have is to be able to say who we are. Define yourself. And if you can't do that, which is what happens, that's taken away from you, I think that is, in a sense, is a negation of you, but more seriously, it's a death of you because others are defining you. And in one sense, that is what Edward Said wrote about in Orientalism. And he said, we've lost our own identity. We can't define ourselves. So that was the challenge. So in postmodernism and Islam, I was looking at all those philosophers and scholars, and I was asking, what is the role of Muslim? What is Islam bringing to the table? And now we have the same debate within Islam, within Muslims. How much interaction do you need to have without crossing red lines within the religion itself? And you're seeing this. Uh, sometimes very dangerously being played out, especially in the Muslim world. In the Muslim world, scholars are actually shot and killed. In the Middle East, they're shot and killed. It's a very dangerous business. Um, 
when we talk about the Taliban and so on, as you guys know that the TTP has re-emerged. The TTP is a, a strain within the, the Taliban, but it's a very particularly violent strain. They've re-emerged and their target is the hospital, the school, the religious gathering, the bus stop, and they are ruthless. So they killed, for example, in, um, in Peshawar, they killed uh, 150 students and teachers in a school, young boys in camp on campus in their classrooms. That's also within Muslim society. So Muslims have to find an answer to that. And the answers, of course, what we'll be challenged by into the future. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Ahmed. I'm wondering how we're doing on time. Um, Professor Vine, Professor Maro. And uh, audience, you've been a wonderful audience. I do want to introduce my grandson. I'm very proud of him. Alexander, stand up and show yourself. <laughs> when I ask him where does he want to study in the future, he keeps saying some university called Harvard and doesn't say American University. <laughs> Okay, yeah. yeah. Maybe if you could slide over, we'd be able to have it. So we're going to turn things over to Minissa to offer some Hi, everyone. reflections. Um, I'm just going to say a really very short few things since it's 6.30 and we want to open things up for discussion. Um, but thank you both for that conversation. It was really great to hear about the work. Um, I guess I'm just going to start by saying uh, that um, I have a bone to pick with David, <laughs> which is always a good thing to have, um, which is about this question about why anthropology matters. And so I always just like wonder about a question like this, like, does it make it seem like we have something to prove? Um, and if we have something to prove, why do we have something to prove? And should we have something to prove? Um, and do we need to really provide a reason that we matter over and over again? Um, and so I think there is like a trend in anthropology that like keeps like replaying itself. Where we're always like, we matter, we matter, we're over here, we matter. Um, and so I guess maybe like I feel a little, yeah, this is my bone pick with David. Sorry, I'm landing this on you, David. <laughs> You're an easy scapegoat. But um, so I guess I just want to start there by saying that maybe we can just like say that we matter, say that the work we do and the knowledge we produce matters, and then think about what we need to do with it, which I which I think is maybe the question that um, that we're kind of like circling around more, you know? Um, so then I was thinking about this and I was thinking about like, what do we think our discipline's main strength is? Like, what is the strength of what we do? Um, and I think we often turn to ethnography and we often say like our strength is ethnography and our ethnographic method. But I wanna, I, I wanna just think about how we can push beyond saying that we're just about ethnography, that we're just about a method, right? Um, as we know, the ethnographic method was born out of empire, right? It was a tool of empire. Um, it created information for colonies, right? Or for, not for colonies, but for colonial centers, Listen, right? Can I colonies. just jump yes. in and respond to that? Uh, yes, comment? yes, go for it. Uh, I know that this is one of the tropes that anthropology comes up through empire. It's not correct at all. In fact, anthropology goes back to Al-Biruni in the 12th century, to Ibn Khaldun, who's considered the father of anthropology, half a millennium ago, long before the British Empire and the colonial empires. And I think it's tragic that we don't see that it's very much part of our own cultures. So I don't see this at all as a European, Western, colonial uh, imposition on us. Yes, it has that aspect. I know what you mean when you have all these old colonial officers coming in, uh, being part of the administration in Africa and so on, and writing ethnography. So that there is an association. And a lot of the prejudices obviously come in, and some of the titles tell us that there was that prejudice when people, local people, are described as savages and so on. There's that. But how can you dismiss the anthropology that we've inherited, very proudly inherited, going back a thousand years ago, and I've given you some examples. I can give you many more examples. And they, you also got, go back even to the Greeks, 
So I don't think anthropology is a colonial subject. It is a subject, and I think we should be teaching these kids that there is uh, a very fair chance of their understanding the world through this prism and not being blurred by this idea that it's a foreign, because I know immediately it puts up a puts up the back of a lot of people when they're told that it's, we were, when we were being educated, I was at SOAS and we were told constantly that it's a colonial subject and uh, we have to reject it because it's a white man subject, et cetera. And I said, well, it's not a white man subject. Ibn Khaldun and Al-Baruni are part of my culture and my society. So how can you reject them? Uh, you have uh, those great classics written by uh, Indian sc scholars in Sanskrit who are not uh, long, long before even the Muslims came. So there's that contribution. And in Islam itself, and Heba will confirm this, uh, the Quran constantly talks about learning, looking at the world, looking at your neighbors, people with different languages, people with different cultures, and an and almost religious duty to understand societies around you. So it's almost an anthropological urge in our communities to understand the world because there's a religious basis because when you understand people, you respect them. And the exact uh, word used is you wonder at them, wonder at the marvel of the of these people around you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, thank you for that. I think what you're pointing to, which is important, is that maybe we could look to an alternative genealogy of the discipline, right? So the genealogy I'm talking about is the one that makes anthropology a discipline, right? In the academic sense of a discipline um, coming from, you know, the UK and, you know, um, British anthrop social anthropology. Um, and so I, I like the idea of looking to an alternative genealogy um, of anthropology, actually. Um, I think that's um, a really good corrective. Let's so, do a paper together on that. <laughs> okay. Alternative genealogies of anthropology, sure. Um, yeah, that'd be that'd be fun. Um, so, but what I'm trying to say is that we don't want to we don't want to just reduce ourselves to a method that we think of as coming out of this tradition, right? And so, if we want to get beyond reducing ourselves to this method, where what do we do, right? It has to be about the strength of our analysis, then, right? There has to be something about our analysis that matters. Um, and so, um, and this this is my very short thought, off the cuff thoughts from from thinking today. Um, I think one of the strengths of our analysis has always been. Um, the capacity for self-reflection, right, in 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 the field. And so, what I want to say about self-reflection is, I think that beyond self-reflection as well, um, the discipline needs to think of self-reflection not as just a personal sort of self-reflection, but as political self-reflection as well, right? So that to be relevant, we have to be constantly reflecting on what the politics of our work are. And so that's just, that's like really all I want to say is that an anthropology that is explicitly in our analysis, reflective on our politics, and anti-imperial, anti-war, abolitionist, right, that takes these politics really seriously and thinks about how to enact them in the world, that is an anthropology that is relevant and that matters, right? Otherwise, I do think we can just be reduced to all these other things. So... And we say you'll be pleased to know because of the definition that you have or an ideal definition of anthropology, <laughs> that in all our fieldwork, we had a very strict balance, gender balance, mm -hmm. religious balance. We made maintain right ranking throughout. He's the witness to it. So that we consciously went out of it. Because I genuinely believe you cannot understand society without also taking the perspective of how do women think, how do the young think, when in fact we took these youngsters out, a lot of people objected. My colleague said, how can you take these students? What, what contribution can they make? And I said, they will make a contribution because they look at the same society I'm looking at, except they look at the, those societies through young eyes. Mm -hmm. And that's a perspective that I don't have. And I learned a lot from them. Mm -hmm. In fact, the last book of mine, uh, Journey into Europe, is dedicated to Frankie. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just reversing reversing the colonial experience. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I also the, the last thoughts I have, <laughs> which um, are just that I think the other thing is that what we are trying to do is we're trying to learn with people, right? We're trying to really think seriously and really take seriously what they're telling us, 
right? And that's not something that I think other disciplines do in the same way some do, but that journalism does in the same way, that AI does in the same way. And what I've learned from my research in doing this is that my, my politics are, I, I've learned my politics from the people I've worked with, right? From that process of thinking politically, thinking about how we can change the world, thinking about how we can, you know, be create a world that is different than the one we have right now with other people, right? And learning from them and learning through that process. And so I think um, these are the things that matter to me about um, anthropology, I guess. And these are the things I think are not replicable in AI or in um, journalism or filmmaking or things like that. So that's all, those are my really quick thoughts because I know um, we want to open things up to discussion. Um, did you want to say something also, David? No, I, I think that was really helpful and fantastic. And Thanks. I think this is a good moment where we could take maybe at least three questions, comments, observations, and then turn it back to our fantastic panelists to offer some reflections and then come back to the audience and just open things up. Um, maybe I saw three hands right there and it's perfect all in one row. That, mm -hmm. that, there was, uh, maybe have I been moved to the left? Okay, okay. 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 Uh, thank you so much. Um, Loud enough. <laughs> I know. Um, thank you so much for this. Uh, I don't know. I want to pick your brain and push a little bit on like how evil AI might be. Maybe it might also have some advantages, especially like um, I, my dissertation research is focused on uh, working class women in Egypt who work on digital platforms. And some of them are making $2,500 a month versus the average family in Egypt would make around $200 a month, like working class families. So I don't know, like, don't you think that maybe what anthropologists can do right now to maybe push on like how work can be different after AI, maybe like think about things like universal basic income or like how do we bridge the gap of like wealth distribution using AI? You want to just pass it immediately to you, right? Yeah. Go ahead, Nora, say the next question. Yeah. Sure. I think I'm going to pull up my notes. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed, for coming and your time. Thank you for all the professors for putting this together, as well as the attendant. But I had thought of a question. It's more about substantive in your content and your research, so your life. And I'm interested in knowing from your perspective and understanding Muslim people in the US in a time under heavy surveillance. Uh, many people fear that technology will enable entities to surveillance even more. How does humanity and people change under surveillance through your experience as an anthropologist? And what does surveillance say about fear in humanity? Thank you for that question. Yeah. Uh, my name is Sher Ali. Uh, I'm from Lahore. Uh, I was at, at OSU Geography's PhD program, but I graduated out with a second master's and I was a journalist before this. Uh, there were two two themes which I think came out. One was a comment by, uh, I think, Professor uh, Vine surrounding uh, the implications of AI and its technology. And it sort of reminds me of the debate that went around uh, GIS, whether technologies are a science or a tool, and you know uh, the implications around that. I think like one thing is the data around it is really something we have to look at and uh, sort of how these systems work. Because I know like in terms of uh, NASA and a lot of these organizations, the way uh, certain data is being collected, that is not transparent. There's no transparency in terms of that. Uh, the other thing was, um, I mean, I had two questions for Professor Ahmed, but uh, but I'll just like focus on this this point between slow versus fast ethnography, right? Uh, in 
in an environment where, uh, because you met, uh, mentioned Geertz, right? And how you were a contemporary of a person who talked about th thick descriptions and being on the ground for long periods of time and building relationships with communities on the ground, not just passing through various spaces. Um, so like, what are the implications of fast journalism in a sort of increasingly corporatized, neoliberalized, privatized academia where, you know, we have less resources for grad students to con to at least gain a foundation, like you're saying. You know, I know University of Chicago, they train their students from the, from the point they enter to to learn about Ibn Khaldun and these things. We don't read that in foundational courses anymore. You know, we, so yeah. You had two questions, Shirley, you just asked one. What's your second question? I think there are at least, so at least first, two questions in there. Just about uh, AI and sort of uh, critical GIS and the parallels. So I think I think there are uh, at least four questions on the table. Uh, we only have officially about 15 minutes left, uh, and I would want to get more voices from the audience in the room. So maybe I could ask each of you to offer some quick comments in reaction to one or more of the questions, and then we would turn back to the audience. Go first. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for all those questions. Um, I I think this uh, curriculum question is a fascinating one, and uh, I uh, I it, it really is. And through the, these projects, I really my mind has really been open to these different genealogies. We're talking about genealogies um, of what we should be reading in different disciplines, and this like. Professor Ahmed was saying, I mean, these uh, classics going beyond the Western canon and saying this is actually relevant to anthropology because these are people, these are social scientists, they're studying society, they are trying to understand society, how it works, and, they're, and, and, and a lot of times they're about the other. They're from not their own society, not always. Um, and then also working on this project Journey into Europe, which was the last project we did, I mean, it was just absolutely fascinating to see how European thought was impacted by thought coming from other places in the in the world, and particularly the Muslim world, through Spain, through Sicily, through the Balkans, where, I mean, just entire ways of thinking, like um, Averroes, uh, the scholar, uh, Muslim scholar in Spain, talking about balancing reason and faith. In an Islamic context, that enters Europe, and it's picked up by Aquinas and all these other figures, and it enters Europe. It enters the mainstream discussion. It impacts the Renaissance. So we have to think, I think, a little bit more broadly about the, some of these links and these genealogies, which are so fascinating and illuminating and can help us connect different cultures. Uh, thank you, Rengi. Um, I'd like to respond to the question about slow versus fast anthropology. Now, this is where coming from what was called the first world helps the anthropologist because anthropology was essentially in terms of Western anthropology, not colonial anthropology, but Western anthropology, an offshoot of the elite. So in the 19th century, you had to be well off, you had to have uh, private income, often, you, know, you had to go to a, an elite university, Oxford, Cambridge, and so on, to be able to go to a different country, spend one or two or three years, have all the assistance and the paraphernalia of fieldwork. Now, when you compare that to contemporary anthropology, where you have to struggle for funds and scholarships and grants and all, it's very difficult. Therefore, the idea of slow versus fast is linked to the condition of anthropology at that stage in that particular country. So Gates is coming out of the 50s and 60s of America, lots of resources, world power, and he's able to go out to Morocco and then to Indonesia and spend a long time. That's where, where he does this uh, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant work, as does Larry Rosen also from Princeton, also in Morocco and uh, uh, did his work with him. Now, the other comment was on fear and uh, you asked the question. 
surveillance. Surveillance and fear. Um, you're already seeing the effects of that on communities. There are many studies about the Uyghur who are being watched all the time. And AI is being used with deadly effect. Uh, I was told that the AI now can spot you and identify you not only through your face, but from the back. So if you're walking in the bazaar or in the souk, it can spot you from your back and identify you and you're condemned. So what's happening there, the reports that come out, unfortunately not many, but we do have credible reports. Uh, we see some very disturbing um, illustrations of what AI can do to destroy a community. And those Uyghurs who are able to come out and speak, they literally are broken individuals. So I think it's again, and I want to emphasize uh, the humanist basis of societies. When governments begin to use such methods, they're destroying not only communities, but the individual. And that again, if you take the individual at the heart of the European enlightenment, <clears throat> you're compromising that very definition of enlightenment which is to value the individual. That's what's happening with the uh, development of that kind of pernicious, nefarious uh, technology. And we have to be very careful about that. Oh, sure. I mean, I guess I have a, oh, this is long, but um, I, I think what you're pointing to, right, is the material conditions of work, right, that some people are possibly benefiting from this, right? Um, that is, I'm happy to hear that for them, I guess is what I would say. I think the concerns that um, we are pointing to with AI, or, you know, what Professor Ahmed just mentioned, right? Are the use of it as a another art, you know, tool in an arsenal of repressive tactics by the state. Right, and I and I I do I do say the state uh, very um, you know explicitly and intentionally because I think this will be a tool of repressive states, right? Um, and so the question then for me about like people who have who are who are you know what did you say? Who, who can you explain the situation? Again? I think generally I I feel like it's kind of opening up opportunities where like people who cannot afford to have like editors or assistants they can now access mm -hmm. like services mm -hmm. like that which can help in like a little bit of setting. yeah sure yeah yeah that's like <laughs> we, why why would we have a problem with that <laughs> you know? I'm just trying just trying to think about what how can we kind of like put like study that that as an anthropologist and think about mm -hmm. the future of work yes and how maybe push like to for like universal basic income and stuff mm -hmm. like that because now it's it, it is more possible definitely yeah so I was, I was just saying that it could be a progression of where anthropology can go when it mm -hmm. comes to labor relations and stuff like that. yeah I think that's super interesting yeah so yes thank you for bringing that up <laughs> um yeah I don't have any other thoughts on that. <laughs> Uh, are there other questions? Yeah, um, Ray. Yeah, it's not a question, but it's speaking to what minutes? Oh, oh, sorry. Hi, I'm Ray. Thank you so much for the talk. Um, it's not a question, but I'm. It's a response to Manissa. So there's actually a lot of literature on AI and labor, and I think that there is this tendency which I think anthropologists are very kind of well positioned to challenge that AI is either superhuman as in like the Terminator that Professor Ahmed was talking about or just inhuman, right? Um, but when you actually look at the labor that goes into AI and the kind of extractive um, practices that fuel AI, the distinction between human and AI is very blurry, right? So, um, uh, I'm blanking. I think Mary Gray is her first name. She wrote a great book that I guess now is a little bit dated because of how fast things move. Um, but she talks about uh, failure in AI and how when AI quote unquote fails, human beings literally like have to step in and act like AI, right? So I think we need to be really wary of thinking about AI as this like completely new thing that's just going to like destroy everything. A, because 
if you're talking about intelligence, it doesn't exist, right? AI as we are, as is being marketed to us, doesn't really exist. It's just a little bit more advanced than Google, right? So it's not to say that it's not dangerous. It's just to say that the ways in which it is dangerous are far more mundane. And the questions about AI's implication on labor are far more complicated than just, does this make it easier for people to edit things, right? Because AI itself is powered by exploited labor all across the global South. See if we can get at least a couple more comments, questions from the audience. Thank you for that comment. And we just want to say, Can we just take um, two yeah. more comments just to get as many voices in the room as possible. Thanks. Hi. Okay. Um, my name is Sana. First, thank you guys for your insight. Um, I have a question for Dr. Ahmed. Um, as you previously stated, you um, said that the world was heading towards and is experiencing more violence and more misery. And um, being a Pakistani and a Muslim after um, post 9-11 America and currently living here, um, do you feel as if the American perspective on Islam and the prevalence of Islamophobia has also worsened as like the conditions of the world are also headed towards? Uh, we just take one more and then I know it's a lot. To... Thank you very much. Uh, that was really, really interesting and I appreciate it. I will be as brief as I, brief as I can. Um, I, uh, from my much, much more limited experience in ethnography, uh, have, you know, uh, found very little that, you know, when I go to a new community or a different community, I find very little that is, you know, I often find that there's very little to compare between two communities that there's not as much shared as one would expect, even in communities that you might sort of think of as the same. But one of the things that I've found almost everywhere I've gone is somebody who will say things used to be a lot better. Uh, and I wonder, is that true from your guys's perspective? one more person who wants to get one more yes great um, because i want to be respectful of everyone's time and give the panelists and Vanessa one more opportunity to offer some final thoughts um hello thank you again for coming to speak with us um my question is about kind of how anthropology I guess, an AI almost compare or maybe even compete um, in terms of how we kind of bridge the gap of world thought as globalization kind of just emerges uh, rapidly <laughs> and kind of what that looks like for communities that don't have access in, you know, directly or indirectly to AI and what that knowledge will look like and whether that will, you know, reinforce like the disparities that we see today already. So we're just at about one minute before the top of the hour. So maybe if each panelist, and including Vanessa, could offer two minutes of yes, I thought the first final thoughts. Thank you. Getting your cardio. In. Thanks for ever, all all of your questions. Um, I just yeah, briefly on the disparity. I think a, a lot of there's there's a lot of interesting scholarship on because AI is just collecting mass amounts of information, but it's collecting mass amounts of digital information. So a lot of people that are not, or information that is not in that digital space is not necessarily being collected. So there are lots of um, uh, gaps there that is important for us to think about, I think. Um, but then also, yeah, I just transcribed my first interview with like it was like an automated thing through word and it was amazing. Like I couldn't believe it. And I just like uploaded the file. It transcribed the entire thing and I just read along with it, but like 95% of it was correct. And we spent, you know, years typing out uh, all of these. Uh, um, uh, so yes, so the, there's some uh, definitely positive things that we could, if anthropology could use it um, in, furtherance of those uh, these very noble goals that we have, I think it would be good. Um, I'm sorry, I lost track of all the questions. Um, and um, 
have like a trial, a baby um, crisis happening on my phone. But anyway, so I got distracted also. So um, I, Ray, can you, do you want to talk about AI labor? And no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I don't study AI. I just want to say that from the get-go. I don't study AI. I look. I do look at the impacts of the technology industry on urban space. Okay, so that is what I I do study. And what I can say about that technology industry and the sort of capital that's being poured into AI right now, um, and the way that the technology industry. Um, and you know, I studied the San Francisco Bay Area, so at, is based in San Francisco. Operates is that this the amount of the amount of money being poured into this technology right now has profound effects on the way we think about. Um, it has effects that trickle down, at least in the San Francisco Bay Area, in terms of wealth inequality and eviction and displacement. And so that's like where I come into this is like, I'm concerned about those things. And I am always concerned about those things. And then so I'm concerned about the way in which um, massive amounts of money um, uh, get thrown at these new technologies without much oversight, without much thinking about what they're doing, um, without much responsibility. And so that that and then the second thing I'm concerned about is the way that we um, have very little oversight over any sort of tools of repression that are technologically, you know, more advanced every year. And so those are the two things when I worry about AI. That's what I worry about. If anyone was interested in what I worry about when it comes to AI, <laughs> um, <laughs> Professor Ahmed. Yes, yes um, a happy story from AI. On my birthday, my grandson gave me a poem beautifully typed out, and I was very impressed. It's a long poem, beautifully reflecting rhyme and rhythm and alliteration and all the uh, tools of a good scholar of the English language. And I was very impressed by him. Now, he's a very bright boy, so I said, you know, it's possibly. And he told me then that he worked with chat GPT. <laughs> And that's what it is. And I said, what? So that is my first introduction to the benefits of AI. <laughs> now, Tana, your question about uh, America, where we are with the Muslim community. America is a fascinating society. It's a very dynamic, changing society. As they say, a work in progress. It offers immense possibilities, immense hope. And that's what you're seeing, because even the Muslim community, and remember it starts with 9-11, 3,000 Americans killed, a lot of questions about America. We are now in a position where Muslims are very prominent in politics, in the media, and they're really appearing. And for the first time, I see that they are interacting and being accepted. Now, there are still attacks on uh, women wearing hijab, on mosques and so on. But we must also remember that alongside that, there are also attacks on other minorities. So the uh, synagogue was attacked a few years ago where so many people died. Uh, the Sikhs were attacked. The Sikh temple was attacked. Hindu women were pushed onto the uh, tracks in the New York subway. So this kind of ignorance is there. Very often when I'm picked up for the media, it was taxi drivers, Sikh. And they tell me because they wear a turban and a beard, they say that even now, years after 9-11, people will shout at them and say, go home, Osama. So that prejudice remains, and those are individual prejudices. But what is heartening is the fact that society has responded and moved on. And I think that's a great hope for us. Now, having said that, you also have to look at so much prejudice and unhappiness in the other parts of the world. We mustn't forget that. That is a crisis. It's not just for against Muslims. Hindus are suffering, Jews are suffering, Christian in different places. You may be a majority in one country, but you'll be a minority in another country. We have to remember that. And therefore go back to Hillel the Elder's quotation that you must treat others as you expect them to treat you. And thank you for coming, Sana. Thank you. to our panelists. Lucky for all of us, David went to go get food. <laughs> so I am Rachel Watkins. I'm Associate Professor and Chair 
of the Department of Anthropology and also photographer for the evening. So I just wanted to close us out, just kind of amplifying so much of what was said here tonight. There's a really long and integrative history of anthropological research and study and teaching learning on this campus spanning SIS and CAS um, for many, many years. And the work produced has had a great impact on this campus, the city, the nation, and certainly the world. So I'm willing to join you in taking our work is important as a default as we move forward. And I think we all uh, agree with that. So I just want to say again, thanks to the anthro department, so many of us who are here, students past, present, in progress, um, our students, um, you all are so important to what we do, and we're so glad that you are here. Um, our colleagues across, our anthropological colleagues across the campus, um, and we, of course, want to thank the Ibn Khaldun Center and SIS for helping to support this event. And I am also very proud to say that I first learned of Ibn Khaldun as a um, anthropology major at Howard. Um, so, so yes. So thanks again, everyone, and enjoy gathering for as long as you can. Please stay as long as you can. Um, if not, we look forward to gathering in some way, shape, or form soon. Thank you. Thank you. The food will be here momentarily, uh, but there is plenty to drink. Uh, the food is coming from Refugees, uh, excuse me, from Falafel Inc., which is a wonderful hey. refugee supporting restaurant in East Oh, no. Uh, uh,